Thank you, Your Excellency. That was um, really wonderful. It's such an honor to share the stage with you. And let me just start by also thanking um, all of the archons who worked so hard and staff and volunteers who worked so hard to pull this together. I, this is my third of these conferences. I was fortunate to join the one in Berlin and in Washington, and each continues to exceed the one before it. Um, having these meetings in these historic settings is really quite resonant of ancient democracy and of modern democracy and the, the interchanges between uh, the Greek diaspora and uh, Greece itself and, and Greeks across. And um, we're so, so honored to have you join us in that setting, particularly because, because you come from a proud diaspora as well, one whose last names end in a vowel and an S. Uh, in that sense, either you're an honorary Greek or we're honorary Lithuanians, but we are uh, happy to have you in our community. You, and maybe, you, you yeah. probably had the same problem as we did growing up in the United States. Friends like polychitis, rolonitis, and other <laughs> diseases. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you've had the experience of finding someone with a name that ends that way and approaching them and finding out that no, in fact, they're not Lithuanian, they're Greek, or vice versa. Um, and, and let me start with that. Tell, tell us a little bit about your own personal story. Um, being born in the United States to Lithuanian parents who came from situations where religious freedom couldn't be taken for granted. Um, how did that shape your own faith journey and your own professional journey of service? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, l let me go back because my journey starts with my parents as most of ours do. My parents were separated during the Second World War. My uh, father was uh, mobilizing with the military uh, as the, the front came through Lithuania, and he got picked up with a couple of friends to dig trenches near the front, and they were able to escape, uh, and they escaped through Poland into Germany. He ended up in the displaced persons camps for the remainder of the war, but my mother and my then one-and-a-half-year-old sister remained in Lithuania. When the war ended, the Iron Curtain came down, and my uh, father could not return. My mother and my sister could not leave. But on top of that, they had lost complete contact during the war. So for 12 years, they had no idea if one or the other side had survived the war. And it was only through friends of friends of friends that uh, they, my father found out that everybody was alive. And he started trying to uh, make uh, attempts to get them out of the Soviet Union. Um, what finally succeeded was that he was able to get a list, their names on a list in the State Department. And when Vice President Nixon met with Nikita Khrushchev in 1959, a part of that meeting included a goodwill gesture on the part of Khrushchev to allow 200 separated families to reunite from all around the, the Soviet Union. And so my mother and my sister were on that list. They were able to come to the United States in 1960, and I was born in 1961. You can do the math. Um, and. Uh, so I grew up, my first language was Lithuanian because it was truly my mother tongue. Uh, my mother did not speak any English when I was born. Uh, and um, I grew up in the Lithuanian, the hyphenated American communities, which have many similarities across the board. Um, but uh, we've always kept in touch with, with the Lithuanians, and my parents were very active in the support uh, of the underground church in Lithuania during the Soviet era, uh, assistance and also getting the word out, which is uh, just as important in, in societies to let people know of the persecutions. Uh, and my, I, uh, as the bio reads, uh, had, uh, 
began my studies uh, after high school in uh, math computer science. I worked for IBM for five years before I finally understood that God was giving me a different calling um, and entered the seminary at the time that Lithuania was un still under occupation. There were the first signs of freedom coming. And while I was in seminary, Lithuania became independent. I had begun my studies to serve the Lithuanian diaspora, mainly in the United States. And uh, at, the, at that point, Lithuania became independent. The local bishop, uh, well, I asked the local bishop if I could do a summer pastoral assignment in Vilnius and get a sense of Lithuania. And very quickly into what was supposed to be a two month temporary summer assignment, three weeks into which he asked me to uh, take a year off of uh, studies, come and help him who had just arrived to set up and uh, got my first assignment as a seminarian. He ordained me a deacon and my first job was organizing John Paul II's visit to Lithuania in 1993. So my first job as a very young seminarian deacon uh, was to organize a papal visit in a country I'd never lived in. Uh, so it's always a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and t tell us a little, and beforehand we had a chance to talk, and I think it's, it's instructive to talk about the relationship that you had with, um, it, including through your mother, with what was more or less an underground church during communist time. What did you learn about how authoritarians viewed religion, why they feared it, and how religious communities in that context could and should behave? The Soviet Union was an interesting um, modus operandi of how they, they actually worked because technically the Soviet constitution uh, guaranteed freedom of religion. In practice, it was quite different. And so, um, whereas the, uh, the government did not shut down all the seminaries, they left one seminary and they allowed 25 seminarians to enter the seminary each year, which through attrition would eliminate most of the priests uh, in the country. Uh, but it divided the situation uh, amongst, within the church. There were those bishops and priests and lay people who were looking for a modus vivendi, uh, the ability to find a way to, that the church continue to operate. So they would enter into agreements with the government so that they could build a church that they would not uh, send a priest away um, and so that was one part of the church that was working to ensure uh, its viability in the future at least minimally there was another part of the church that went very much underground and the underground church uh, would teach uh, prepare catechesis um, evangelize um, to give you an example, the, the, the law would read that a priest could examine children before giving First Communion, the catechetical preparations, but he could not teach them. So, and priests were sentenced to years of prison or, or exile because of teaching children catechesis. So there was a, a really thin line, a game that was being played. Uh, you had a lot of other people who uh, underground sisters, nuns, who would secretly catechize, prepare families, uh, and uh, prepare the way so that the, the, the continuation of the community, the, the catechesis would continue. Um, and you had a group of priests that started, there was a, a famous underground publication, one of the first Samizdat underground publications that began printing, we just celebrated 50 years a couple years ago, uh, of this publication called the uh, Chronicle of the Catholic Church in Lithuania. And it was set up by a group of priests, five of them, who, um, that was called the, the Committee for the Defense of Believers' Rights. Uh, many of them eventually were sentenced to uh, labor camps in Siberia 
but they were able to organize this underground publication whose purpose was to document the uh, persecution of the church, but they did it in a very um, uh, unique way. What they said was, Mr. Gorbachev, these, your constitution says there is freedom of religion. We are going to do the nation a favor and help to document where the constitution is being broken. And they would document the persecutions. They would then secretly compile little booklets of these and uh, ship them one way or another to the West. So people would read them to some degree and then they would smuggle them out to the West. In the West, we uh, would translate them. Um, we would have our uh, Radio Free Europe, Vatican Radio, Radio Liberty, would broadcast the reading of these back to Lithuania. So it served a, a, a multiple purpose. One, it was the, uh, the West found out about the persecutions that were currently going on and the trials of people, uh, the sentences, the, the gulags. Two, it uh, well, was also good for uh, informing uh, lawmakers and politicians of what was really going on. But it had a, a different effect. When, um, an unexpected effect, I would say, when these, for example, a teacher who was persecuting students for wearing a cross or having gone to church and would reprimand them during their uh, school session, and this would get documented in the Chronicles, it would get shipped out, and then broadcast back. Well, a lot of people listened to these uh, broadcasts and they found out that the school teacher in our village was persecuting these children and they'd shame her for complying with the communist system. So it developed a whole different level on society. You had the people who were working with the government, you had the people who were working against the government and taking punishment for it. And that whole movement really developed a, a, part of the, uh, uh, a part of the thing that broke the system. Um, it, scripture says the truth will set you free, and this was a fine example of it. They, they uh, broadcast the truth, and that was one of the things that finally contributed to bringing it down the system. It's really terrific. It, it's really terrific, it touches on as we discuss this, this vast topic for the conference has so many different dimensions to it and we think about a world with eight billion people, as we heard in this morning's session, about six, six out of 10, 60%, five billion or so people live in political systems that have some range of persecution, discrimination or curtailment. Um, and, and even within Western liberal democracies, as you mentioned in your remarks, there are these stresses on religious communities that make it very challenging to operate. So I guess my question to you now is you have, you have these three jobs, um, or maybe four at least, right? You are the Archbishop of Vilnius. You're the president, I hope I can get this right, of the Council of Bishops Conferences in Europe. And then you're also the chief prelate to the armed services. How do you prioritize across these range of challenges, um, starting with authoritarian countries quite literally on your border that have been part of your personal story and Lithuania's story, and now certainly a big part of Orthodox Christian story. Y you, you are the pastor to um, or at least colleague of other bishops across Europe who think about both challenges at home, but also because we are open pluralistic societies with people who come from all over the world seeking religious liberty, a connection to these places around the world. H how do you prioritize? How do you, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. How do you pick and choose um, where to fight the fight? I think part of it is really that, you know, People ask, how, how do you manage to do it? And you don't. 
You really don't. You just do what you can. Um, and you, you have to let God pick the priorities sometimes, and you find that he's doing it. Um, there's a great story of Pope John XXIII, who was frustrated with some of the problems he was facing in the church, and he said to have said one evening, Lord, it's your church. I'm going to bed. You take care of the problems. <laughs> um, which is not a bad way to live. Do what you can, and then let God do what he must. Um, there's just uh, an avalanche of problems. And I think part of the, you know, when you say 60% of the world is under autocratic systems, uh, I tend, and I think as you heard in the speech, uh, to always head back to the religious viewpoint of the situation of the world. Uh, there is a reality of sin. It is not new and we are suffering from sin in the world. And that affects our interpersonal relationships, both individually and societally by communities. Um, persecution of the faith is nothing new. Uh, persecution of peoples in human rights is nothing new. We talked about slavery, uh, which has been an acceptable part of many uh, communities, but it is something that the world has for a large part, but has not allevi alleviated. If we talk about uh, the um, uh, traffic, human trafficking, you still have a lot of slavery in the world today. Uh, you have countries. And so it is, uh, it is part of the battle between good and evil in which we are involved. Um, and uh, sin is at the heart of it. And God's... Uh, domination and the ultimate conquering over evil is, is something that we are, um, we are in the midst. And it helps us, especially in the battles that we have to face on a daily basis, and even in this, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola has a great, uh, well known for his uh, retreat and his meditations. And there's a meditation I like going back to often. And it is uh, the, called the meditation of the two standards, the two flags. And the, the, um, the meditation entails trying to decide what you would choose. On one side, you are offered to be one of the top generals in Satan's battle forces with all the regalia and all the goodness of being the top brass and the general. On the other side, you are, often, you are offered to be uh, a private in God's army polishing the general's shoes every day, or worse, and knowing that there will be battles that Satan's army will win, but knowing the end result of the battle, of the war, is going to be God's uh, conquering, which position do you choose? And so it, it's a matter of really framing all these questions that we have before us and uh, with regard to uh, religious freedom and persecution in that frame of the battle. Uh, you fight your fight and uh, you do it in the bigger picture. I, the, the early church had many, many martyrs. And there was uh, one of the, the, the famous ones, St. Ignatius of Antioch, as he was being brought to his persecution. I was uh, uh, interested when I, I had read that at the time of the persecution there were some Christians who saw persecution as the big badge of honor that they wanted to have and being a martyr was a great thing. Um, others ran and hid. Ignatius actually did not seek out martyrdom. He's probably one of our most famous martyrs, but he did not seek it out. He tried to avoid getting captured for a long time. He wasn't the one who come out and martyr me. Um, 
But when he was captured and was brought, being brought to his martyrdom, at that point he did not resist because he saw in that God's will. And I think we have to keep that in mind. We have to fight against religious persecution. We have to fight for religious freedom. But we have to do so in the broad uh, vision that it's God's war, not ours. And we have to fight the part that we are given in the battle and not try to draw up our own little uh, kingdoms in the midst. And that's always a, a possible uh, pitfall. In the... um, I, I wonder if, I, if we could talk about some of the authoritarian places in the world. The, the Catholic Church is, is so global in its scope and it, it has um, sometimes very large followings and, and, and flocks in a number of these places. And so even if you're the president of the Council of, of Bishops' Conferences in Europe, you must be interacting on issues of China and Russia and the like. And I, I would, I'm particularly struck from your opening remarks about bringing the language of love to these places and hearing how that sits in some of these societies and interacts or whether or not it does. Um, so I'm wondering if, if we could walk through a few of these. And I was struck by data that I saw from a Catholic organization, Aid to the Church in Need, which along with um, the U.S. Commission on Religious Liberty does an, an incredible job of chronicling persecution and discrimination in these places. And it's 4.5 billion people live under authoritarian governments suffering from these things. So I wonder if we could talk about a few. Um, can we start with Russia next door uh, and how you view the situation today and what you hear from both your flocks and the flocks across Europe that are looking at the pressing challenges there? Russia is always on my mind. Um, they are our neighbors as is Belarus. And so we're, we're not in the best of neighborhoods. Um, yeah, they, there is that expansionist, imperialist mindset. Um, and I think one of the things that Lithuania as such, or the Baltic states as such, can be of service to the rest of Europe, and in that sense, the rest of the world, is that most of the people who live there have a first-hand experience of what it means to live under Russia, under the Soviet empire. They know the mentality more than the West. And I think that is one of the pitfalls that we face is that Western politicians often look at uh, what Russia is doing and try to put it into a Western mentality of decision making. And it is an error. It is an error um, from a military standpoint uh, and from a political standpoint. Russia will push the line, as we've been seeing uh, more and more recently, with the various threats, threats of nuclear retaliation. Um, but they will keep pushing uh, until somebody stands up to them. And we've seen that in Europe where whether it's in Georgia, Sakartvela, where part of the land grab took place, uh, and various other places along the Russian border where they expand until somebody stands up to them, they'll stop temporarily. Um, and that is the danger for Europe. Uh, I see way too many similarities um, of what happened in the European dialogue against Hitler's initial movements of well, maybe, maybe he'll stop at the end of Poland. Uh, and Hitler had also offered a peace settlement. A, a, and um, unt until some people are stopped in their tracks, it's going to keep moving. And that is a great danger, not only for Lithuania or the Baltic states. It, it is a danger for Europe uh, and the world, the, 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 the change of, of power. But uh, even people from those um, countries that are, are within that system, I mean, Russia and Belarus, uh, they have a, a great persecution of religion now. 
uh, and you have priests being arrested, and it's all in that documentation. You, you mentioned earlier that among the, in your Council of Bishops' Conferences, one of the bishops' conferences is Russia. There are Catholic churches in Russia that are uh, part of your flock. Yeah, the, the Council of, uh, of Bishops' Conferences of Europe, there's two of them. One uh, takes the bishops' conferences of the conferences of, of the countries that belong to the European Union, and they have a much more, let's say, political dynamic. Ours is the broader one. So our bishops' conference covers uh, 39, uh, 39 bishops' conferences entailing 45 countries that include the, bishops the Catholic Bishops' Conference in Russia, in uh, Ukraine, in Turkey. So we have a, a very wide scope. But we had a meeting that, that was quite uh, revealing in the sense of the, the, the church's cooperation in that. And the, uh, the bishops of the Ukraine were saying, you know, our people are being deported into Russia and we have some idea where they are, but they need help. And the Bishop's Conference of Russia was saying, as soon as we find out, we will mobilize to make sure that they have the spiritual care that they need uh, where we can find them. It's nothing new that happened after World War II when many uh, Catholics were deported out into Siberia, especially in Lithuania. Um, and the, the local bishop, the local priests were helping. Um, so it, it really is uh, an attempt to uh, do our Catholic duty for our Catholics, whichever country they're from. Uh, so that is, it, it's both a challenge but a necessity, and it's a, a very different perspective. I had the opportunity to visit Ukraine soon after the, uh, within the year of the, uh, the attempt to take Kiev, uh, the, the massacre in Bucha, um, and the people there also. Uh, I'm very proud of the, the, the bishops and the Caritas and the work that they do, not only with the internally displaced, but with the churches uh, in Poland and Lithuania, that have really uh, taken on the assistance to these people who are uh, uh, refugees. And uh, uh, we were talking, about, as my parents were, ref my father was a refugee, uh, it's close to heart. And uh, although I will share one thing, uh, the first migration, we had talked about various migrations. Lithuania had three migrations in the last couple of years. Um, and all three groups were differently accepted by the communities. And so it, it's a challenge from a religious standpoint to keep people's uh, hearts open when the political game uh, is not. The, the, the uh, smallest group that was very warmly accepted were the uh, assistance and trans Slaters from Afghanistan who had assisted our troops when they were there. And when the uh, government there changed, our troops went in and evacuated about 300 Afghans and their families who had helped the troops while they were there. And they were accepted and integrated into society very quickly, also because the military helped them uh, out of thanks. The second group was a political uh, group that uh, Lukashenko had uh, started pushing the borders between uh, Belarus and Lithuania, Belarus and Poland, and Belarus and Latvia. And it was an attempt for a political game of destabilization. And it was one of the most unexpected things when I went to visit. The Caritas people set up camps to take in these refugees, many of whom were from Africa. Um, and most of whom were from Africa, quite frankly, um, Iraq and Africa. Uh, and uh, I, I visited the camp, and I, English is good, French I can get by with, and I was figuring I would talk with them in one of these two languages. And I drove up, and my Caritas people were talking to the Africans in Russian. 
And I just, <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? Um, turns out that the Africans who were being pushed across the border for the most part were students from Africa who had gotten scholarships to study in Minsk, uh, whether it's Russian language, history, literature, and they were students studying, and Lukashenko decided he needed to destabilize the situation at the border with the European Union. And he told the students, you have two choices. Uh, I'm increasing what you have to pay to stay here, and if you can't afford it, you can either go back to Africa, or I will help you go to the European Union. And he brought them to the border, and he pushed them illegally across the border, so there was that whole tension. The Lithuanians saw this as an attempt to destabilize their uh, security of their border. And the government was very, uh, I'd say, hard. Uh, they took all these uh, Africans and put them in a detention center because they were illegally crossing the border. And so their conditions were not good, and our Caritas people tried to help, but uh, they, they were making a political statement to stop the border incursion. And the third group was the Ukrainians, who came in massive numbers, um, and uh, they were very warmly taken in. Uh, they integrated fairly well into society because a lot of the Lithuanians still speak Russian, and so there was a common language, and there was common roots. In the 1500s, uh, Lithuania, Belarus, Poland, and the Ukraine formed a, a commonwealth, and, uh, or as, as uh, I learned, being of the diaspora, I didn't know my history all that well. Um, but while I was studying in Rome, I had a fellow student who was Ukrainian, and uh, we were talking, walking back to, to our rooms, and he says, we Ukrainians, we like you Lithuanians. You're the best occupying force we ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to do a little research, but it was the fact that when Vitotas the Great was expanding the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth all the way out to the Black Sea, one of the things that he did was quite unique historically, uh, and that is that he was able to allow the occupied countries to maintain their language and their culture, which is not typical of an occupation. And so the Ukrainians still remember that. There's a lot of common, and, and so you find the Lithuanians probably one of the strongest supporters of the Ukrainians during the con current war. Hmm. Um, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but I please invite the, I invite the audience to please submit questions that you would have. Um, I'm sorry. There there are um, cards that um, Costa has that Costa will uh, distribute can, cards and pens. Anybody that has a question, please raise your hand, and Costa will get you a card and submit it, and I'll collect them and gather them. A few hands in the back, um, and this way we can try and cluster questions together so that uh, questions along the same, uh, same lines um, as excellent can answer. Um, if, if I can talk, ha have you talk about a few other places where authoritarian governments uh, are challenging religious freedom. Um, uh, I want to come closer to home here in Greece. One of the big challenges that we see across the world is Islamic extremism, pressing religious minorities, and many of the authoritarian countries listed in the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom um, happen to be Islamic countries, uh, both in countries of concern and places that are uh, moving in the wrong direction, as it were. And I'm just curious how you, how in your experience, both in Europe and in your time in Rome and knowing and understanding where the church stands on a lot of these issues, how to deal with the complexities of Christian Islamic relations, particularly in predominantly as Islamic countries where Christians are persecuted or limited in their ability to, to, um, 
to conduct their faith? Let me preface that with an answer so that we're not just in the Christian-Muslim dialogue. Um, I had the opportunity for many years to take part in a group called um, Theobald, which was a ecumenical group of the churches around the Baltic Sea. And each of the countries have the same three predominant Christian denominations in different percentages. So you have the Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, and the Lutherans. And depending on which country you're in, the percentage is dramatically different. Poland and Lithuania are 80% plus Roman Catholic. Uh, Sweden is 80% plus Lutheran. And you have this mix. And the dialogue between the same religions in the different proportions of majority and minorities is vastly different, even within an area that is predominantly Christian of different denominations. So when we go into the dialogue between Islam and Christianity, one would just need to expect that there's going to be difficulties. Um, Pope Francis has, has uh, underlined several times the fact that you cannot justify uh, terrorism and violence in the name of God. And it doesn't matter what religion you belong to. And as I touched on my speech, religious freedom has its limits. When you cross the line and go into violence and terrorism and oppression, you cannot cite that you are doing your religion. You are misusing your religion. And every religion is open to doing that. Ukraine and Russia, for example. You cannot start a war in the name of religion that has a political, uh, now my Italian's coming in, sotto fondo, uh, <laughs> underlying element. Um, and so uh, there are very peaceful Muslims who practice their religion and really uh, they too have mercy as one of God's names. And so that is the basis where you can really reach a dialogue. Uh, there are extremist groups. Uh, there are extremist groups in the Islam faith. There are extremist groups, unfortunately, be they nationalistic or non-nationalistic, within the Christian faith. Uh, the war in Ireland at some time comes to mind. And so you, you have to really bear down and look for what the essential of the religion is. Then you need to dialogue. Uh, and, and that is not easy much of the time. It's a very complex area once you get in. Uh, for Christians, it's, it's very much, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, we're called to love and love of enemies. Uh, and it's that love that defeats all. Uh, now, with a caveat there, that Jesus showed that uh, that type of love can cause death uh, and sacrifice and self-sacrifice. So it, it's, it's not an easy subject. Uh, but uh, in, in working towards peace and working towards dialogue, um, not easy, but necessary, and from a Christian perspective, mandated. So I'll ask one more question, and then we'll start collecting. Um, you mentioned in your remarks and a few times in our, in our conversation um, how we're doing in the West. Um, I'm reminded of Matthew saying that you have to take the log out of your own eyes before you can help your brother remove the speck in, in his eye. And I'm, I'm just curious where you see um, the big challenges ahead in our own societies, where, where you would focus us to do a better job, and also um, where we should not necessarily feel pride, since that's a sin, but where 
we should feel good and continue to do the things that we do well. What are, what are we doing well in, in managing um, religious freedom, supporting and promoting dialogue um, and, and understanding between faiths? I think one of the first things that we have to do is not get tired of talking about it not get tired of bringing it up, acting on it, raising the issue. Um, and I think it's important that in part is my own experience from 50 years of occupation of Lithuania. Um, and I met with the Ukrainian bishops of the Eastern uh, Right Catholic Church and they were asking me because they're getting tired of raising the persecution of their church um, especially with the war going on. And they said, you know, what do you suggest we do? And I said the same thing that we did for 50 years. You just keep raising the thing even uh, when it doesn't look like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, none of us in 1970 thought that the Soviet Union was going to disappear within 20 years. Uh, and it did. So it's a, it's a matter of continuing keeping the faith and raising the issue, working towards the end that we want to achieve. Um, but I also believe that, you know, it, it's not only, and as I alluded to in, in the talk, um, it's, it's not only the autocratic systems that are dangerous uh, to religious freedom. Uh, if, if you get into what is going on in the United States, the polarization, uh, the political infighting that's going on, um, and, and the various movements, whether it's the cancel culture or Me Too or the LGBT, the, the, um, the gender issue. Um, I've been in the privileged place of growing up in the United States and seeing this start there 60 years ago, seeing it come to Western Europe and now moving its way to uh, Eastern Europe. And with, with a very clear agenda coming across. Now one of the things that I'm not used to, uh, wasn't ready for, and uh, did catch me by surprise. One of the accusations against the, the churches, and I say churches because it's one of the things that the churches in Lithuania are pretty united about uh, on the moral aspect. Um, but we get accused of being, uh, following the line of Putin in defense of the family. So if we're doing church teaching on family values, the importance of marriage, uh, he, the, I want to say the West, but um, has copted the the, the, uh, the European West has copted that European values have now become uh, modern, progressistic, gender-based uh, values and anything of the more traditional family values, the importance of marriage is now co-opted to be a supporting of Putin in the Russian line. And so you end up arguing that, no, they took it from us, we didn't take it from them. We've been around this for 2,000 years and more. And so you have to argue it, but it's not one that I was would have thought 20 years ago that I'd be arguing that that marriage and the family is not something that the uh, Russian Empire is putting forth. It is something that the Christian Empire uh, had thousands of years ago. So it, it's always a very complex dynamic, um, but... Uh, one that you have to balance. Why don't, if George, if you can hand me the cards, I'll ask one last question while I read through them, and I think you've, you've probably sorted them for me. Um, but the, the one last question is, you again mentioned in your opening remarks how the internet and um, online is a dimension of this, where it can be a, a positive force and where it poses a number of challenges. If you could just say a word or two more about that. I think as with many technologies, um, there are pluses and minuses and we have to remember that they are technologies. Uh, and how you use it 
uh, is just as important, if not more important, than what the technology uh, can give you. The advantages of everything from the communications, as we saw in the uprising in Egypt, uh, the power of social networks, and the oppression of social networks in places like China and Hong Kong, um, show that they are a very powerful instrument. But that instrument can be used for good and for evil. And so, uh, just as with uh, artificial intelligence, which ironically was the part of my my last steps at IBM, I was entering into artificial intelligence in the early 90s when it was much simpler than it is today. <laughs> um, but uh, it has, I, I now, amongst my other responsibilities, am on the Vatican Dicastery for Communications. So it is something that is often being discussed of how, and the Pope has written several documents in the last year on artificial intelligence, uh, a great tool and also a tool that can cause great destruction. Uh, there is, if we were talking about a nuclear arms race, uh, there is now a uh, artificial intelligence arms race. Uh, and to, to boil it down to its essence, uh, the key argument is uh, at some point the computer will start programming itself and it will do so faster and better than humans can program. So it's an exponential curve. And the first country to reach that, where the computers start working on themselves and improving themselves, uh, is going to be ahead of the race. So you have Russia, you have China, and you have the United States in a head-to-head -head race seeing who's going to get there first. Uh, and it is just as dangerous as the nuclear arms race. So communications can be a great gift. It can be used both for evangelization and community building and truth telling and uh, the pursuit of freedom. Uh, on the other hand, it's an instrument and it can be used as much for evil as for good. So again, it all falls back on the human heart, which is uh, a really tough one. Okay, uh, I'm gonna start reading the questions. Um, I, I'm this is the person writing, I'm disappointed the organized churches, including the Catholic Church and most auto autocephalic Orthodox churches have been reluctant to criticize Patriarch Kirill regarding his complicity. Um, uh, and only the ecumenical patriarch of Alexandria has bravely spoken. Why is this? Are, are, are people scared of Kirill or s scared of provoking Putin or what's going on there? Yeah, I don't think it's a matter of being scared. Um, I, I know more from the Vatican diplomacy standpoint, um, it's sort of a, a, a hope that at some point they can be the uh, the person uh, is the go-between looking for a solution. It, it, and Vatican diplomacy often takes that. Again, from my Lithuanian background, I'm not terribly happy with some of Vatican diplomacy uh, that had taken place during the Cold War. Um, and yet they sort of move in two directions. One is the direction that you can see which is the public uh, saying of official statements and the quiet diplomacy that goes on under the table, behind the scenes. Uh, and I know the Vatican's involved in that. They don't speak of that. On the other hand, I was just uh, in, uh, ah, now he was talking about the Israeli and the uh, Palestine conflict, but, um, I, I know that they are, they are working, trying to find a solution, uh, and to, to condemn takes you out of the possibility to be the peacemaker in the situation. So I think that is the direction. For the other churches, I'm not, um, not sure, and I wouldn't dare to speak in their name. A, a couple questions about um 
a few Western European countries that you probably know quite well, particularly around France and Britain. Um, France, the democratic society, yet expression of religion is prohibited, headscarves, crosses, and the like. Um, uh, someone else asked here, actually, I'm, I'm in favor of dialogue. However, when we look at Britain and France with their issues on Islamic Sharia, how do we, um, uh, I can't read the handwriting here, but how do we condone the same, I think, both in the US and Canada? Do you think Western European countries are managing challenges of religious pluralism well, particularly ex public expressions of faith? Yeah, I, I, I have to admit that uh, I myself had a group of uh, uh, Jewish representatives that came on a trip to Vilnius, and we put them up in, uh, in one of our retreat centers. And we had the discussion, should we take the crosses off the uh, wall before the Jewish group comes in or not? Uh, and to their uh, honor, the, the organizers for the Jewish people said, we know that this is a Catholic house. You don't need to take your crosses off the wall. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not the major sort of view uh, now of what religious tolerance is. Uh, and in one sense, you've got the problem with the burqas and the headscarves. On the other side, uh, we are entering, especially in uh, probably more in Europe than in the United States, uh, a period of censorship for um, expressing one's religious views. There has been a pastor who has been uh, fined and I think maybe even imprisoned for uh, his homilies. Uh, there have been the parliamentarian in Finland who uh, cited a line from scripture that was uh, against homosexuality and she was taken to court uh, for instigating hate crimes she was, uh, the, the court ruled in her favor, and the prosecutor general took her to court again for it. So the, there is that very complex issue of uh, allowing people to express themselves uh, according to their faith and keeping the balance of not promoting violence. Um, Bill, I just want to make one comment on the headscarf issue. Uh, some people in this room know Muna Ndulo, a professor of international law and human rights at Cornell. And uh, he's a friend of mine, I'll admit that. But I asked him a number of years ago, what do you think about the he headscarf issue? Do you support banning the headscarves in France and in other countries? And to my shock, he said, yes, I do. I support the banning of headscarves. I said, why? He said, it's well known among those that do what he does, human rights, that most of the people that wear the headscarves, they don't really want to wear them. They feel pressured by their family. So he looked upon it as really protecting the women by banning the headscarves. And I thought that was a fascinating answer from a very well-known human rights lawyer. The, the next question gets at some of this as well. And uh, you know, these are nuanced, and every, every issue may be a different issue. But um, uh, in this question, at the third Archon, conference in Berlin, Rabbi Schneider made a point that has stuck with the person asking, we should do away with the word tolerance because it infers putting up with. Um, should that word tolerance be changed to accepting or understanding the religious desires, aspirations of others? Well, there's a question I've talked about before, so I'm on. Um, especially from a Christian standpoint, we are not called to be tolerant. We are called to love. And there's a big difference. Um, tolerance is now being used in a wide, wide and abusive way in society. And I, you named it, it's putting up with. I'll deal with you, I'll put you in the corner, you can do what you want, but don't get in the way. Uh, and that is not a Christian perspective. Um, now, loving your enemy, 
that's tough. And does that include putting up with somebody? Yes, but. And the yes, but part is that you have to help them move towards the truth. Um, our, and it was the, the, the document I, I cited at the beginning, Dignitatis Humana, Religious Freedom, caused a great uproar in the Second Vatican Council, almost a split amongst the bishops. And that was because um, the argument boils down to freedom of religion, allowing somebody else to profess their religion, whatever it is. It is freedom of conscience, but it also talks about the right to be wrong. Does a person have a right to error? Because the old Catholic teaching was there is one truth and you must follow that truth. Um, and so a lot of the bishops during the Second Vatican Council said, no, no, we're going in the wrong direction. A person does not have a right to be wrong. Um, and so this was saying people find truth through various paths. And so they, they might find truth uh, because their own culture was Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim and God is calling them to understand him and the truth through the path that they're taking. And as long as they're in good faith and looking for the truth, then yes, because we are not, none of us are born with the full knowledge of truth. We travel on our way to get there. That, that last line is very powerful. It speaks to, um, speaks to humility about under, being able to understand the truth, yet not giving up on the pursuit of it. Um, there are a cluster of questions about Russia, and they all come at different angles in your um, particularly well placed, as it were, to, to answer these, given where you live. Um, one has to do with EU parliamentary elections approaching in June um, and the U.S. elections. Um, how can the apost apostolic churches engage their communicants to engage in democracies in a way that prioritize their faith? And it comes around to Russia here. Can the Conference of European Churches speak and act with impact to address violations of cultural and religious heritage that are endangering faith communities, particularly in Russia, tar targeting religious communities in Ukraine, as well as Turkey and the church and sites in the Holy Land. Um, in your speech, you stated the mission of the church transcends political and social systems. During the Cold War, the Reagan administration worked with the Catholic Church to fight Russian Soviet authoritarianism. What lessons can we learn from this today? And um, someone else asks you to address the apparent contradiction in Russia where the number of churches in Russia has increased dramatically, but at the same time, there also seems to be religious persecution across churches. Um, the first question was, with big elections coming, how can our churches engage particularly you know, where I, 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 I'm assuming in the question and something you touched on, these elections are amplifying divisions with our own societies. Given those things coming up, we have these critical crises facing apostolic churches in Russia, in Turkey, in the Middle East. How do we come together around these challenges at a time when our, um, our own societies are being tested by polarization? I think the first thing that we need to be aware of is even within our own churches, there are different political viewpoints. So we're not going to have one political view. Uh, I can speak for the Catholic Church. It's got every part of the spectrum. Uh, on the other hand, we have to be very well aware as much as in Europe, with the European elections, the United States, with the US elections, there are other forces that are trying to uh, manipulate uh, how uh, we see society, uh, whether it's uh, different lobbies that are, are being 
And from my own personal experience, the, the, even in the Soviet Union, the Russian government would work to infiltrate our local communities, uh, to divide them, uh, to, uh, to cause division. And I think, uh, you know, division diabolos is the one who divides. Um, so there, there is this going on as well, and we see it in the polarization, as you said, of society. We see it within our churches, uh, and I think that's why we need to go back as far as we can to the fundamentals of our faith and base our decisions off of that. Um, there are um, streams and forces that are trying to divide us apart. Um, Russia is a, is a very uh, complex society. Uh, yes, there are more and more religious communities that are forming there and more and more persecution. Um, a book I read recently, uh, even within the, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, their influence over the Soviet years of uh, clergy and faithful uh, by the Soviet regime, by the KGB, uh, and trying to, um, to influence and to have power within the church. Uh, and that, that's something that we all have to be well aware of. Uh, a book I recently read on the, uh, the aspects of the Orthodox Church in Russia uh, and at being a, a military bishop, uh, I found it very interesting. The amount of attention that the Orthodox chaplaincy is giving to the nuclear armament division of the Russian military to be able to make sure that they have a good tie with the leaders of the military in charge of nuclear weapons and the soldiers. So it, it seems to be that it's a very uh, conscientious decision by someone to make sure that there, that influence is there. We see that a bit with some of the rhetoric that is being used by the uh, military chaplaincy of the Russian army in trying to encourage the soldiers to attack. Um, so it, it is not a simple issue uh, and once you get into the Russian, and it's not just Russian, I think the Chinese are just as much involved in trying to sway the elections, be it in the European Union or in the United States as the Russians. So there are a lot of forces in society that are trying to manipulate and it's, it's getting m more and more difficult to sort them out. Um. Has Europe and the church learned from the past and it's being quiet to anti-Semitism prior to World War II? What is currently, what, what is uh, the Catholic Church, I think, in this case, currently doing, given the apparent rise of anti-Semitism as witnessed in the U.S.? I, I think the, the Catholic Church probably is more concerned about anti-Semitism right now with respect to what has been happening in the Holy Land. Uh, and that is a very difficult situation. Uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, at a meeting where the Q&A was done by uh, Archbishop Gallagher, who is the basically foreign minister to the Vatican. Uh, and he was asked, what are they doing with the Palestinian and the Israeli dialogue? And he said, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, the anti-Semitism that we see rising in Europe uh, in one sense, and the, the Holy Father has spoken about it uh, on several occasions, uh, trying to keep people focused on the Jewish community as our elder brothers and not to mix up uh, political decisions by the Israeli Defense Ministry or the Prime Minister uh, with the Jewish people as a, a people, as a faith group. Um, and that's something that he has come back to the Pope on various occasions, trying to keep that dialogue open and to remind people that uh, anti-Semitism is not the way and not to mix up 
politics with the Jewish people. Um, I'm going to just ask this question is written. I think I understand it, but you may, and this may be beyond my understanding. Can you talk of intrafaith traditionalism in both Catholicism and orthodoxy? Is it helpful for Christianity or divisive and harmful? I think once we get to extremes, whether it be on the left, liberal, or the right, conservative, uh, there is a tendency, both within the Catholic Church, within orthodoxy, and quite frankly, in almost every religion, uh, that you lose uh, or you skew the, the truth. Um, not to say, that preserving tradition uh, and the tradition of practice is important for maintaining the tradition of the faith. So you cannot say tradition as such um, is not good because it's very much necessary. Uh, when we go to excessive lengths on either end of the spectrum, you end up with some uh, yeah, skewing of the truth uh, that, that usually causes harm. So I think you see it both in the Catholic Church, you see it in Orthodox churches, um, you, you see it in the Protestant churches, you, you see it everywhere. Um, there, there is a sense of uh, not a neutral centrality, but an evading of extremism on any end. Um, this next question may be getting that. I, I, I'm going to try to capture it. It's, it's a long question, so I'll try to boil it down. I, I think it, it's, it's trying to get an understanding, your understanding, of um, a broader Catholic embrace of human rights. Um, the, the Catholic Church condemned the new freedom of the Declaration of Human Rights many years ago as derail, uh, as I can't read this, uh, uh, absurdisma. Um, the Second Council of the Vatican marks a new self-consciousness of the Catholic Church, or is it simply a change before external development and a sign of the times? I think you get a development through the years of the changing understanding of theology within the society. The basic tenets stay the same, but they are adapted through the centuries. Um, if we go back to uh, the very early history of the church, uh, they were dealing with uh, slavery, as we talked before, and how can a Christian be a slave owner? It seems not to be condemned by Paul, but that he treat his slaves as brothers, which is a whole different. And I think it's, it's a development of an understanding, uh, and I, it goes back to what I alluded to earlier um, with the Second Vatican Council, it was a deeper understanding of a black and white issue. Do you have a right to be wrong or not? Um, and that you are on the way to understanding the deeper truth. Uh, and here as well, um, human rights can be manipulated. Human rights can be misunderstood and we're seeing that the basis of the new, and I say new human rights, that are not based on uh, a religious, but on an individuality, that uh, we're having human rights to things that uh, would not have been considered human rights 50 years ago. Um, and what are they based on marks a difference. So there is a development of understanding, and I think for the Catholic Church, the Second Vatican Council was not only in this sense, but in various other senses, uh, an opening to the acceptance of a wider amount of people. Well, I, I hope you all will join me in not just thanking His Excellency for these remarks, but thanking him for his career of service, his um, uh, enormous love and compassion for 
faith communities around the world and for um, being the best part of the diaspora in all of us, having lived in, in many places and bringing a universal uh, love for one another. And um, I, I just want to say what an honor it's been for me to not just be part of this conference, but to share the stage with you. So thank you.